an Aztec poem rhetorically asked, who could conquer Tenochtitlan? Who could shake the foundation of heaven? The answer to this poem had always been, nobody could. But the Aztec would soon find out that no city is impenetrable. Cortes arrived on the Lake Texcoco. In the middle was the vast city of Tenochtitlan. The city had changed a lot since we last talked about it. The city suffered from floods, so the Aztecs had decided to go Dutch a few hundred years early and build a dam to prevent these floods. The city had grown so large that it now held a quarter of a million people, and the city had been connected to the mainland with giant causeways. And it is on one of these causeways that Montezuma II came out to greet Cortes. And almost immediately, the two sides suffered from massive communication problems. Cortes tried to embrace the Aztec emperor, but touching the emperor was illegal, so Cortes was restrained. Montezuma handed Cortes valuable gifts. This was a normal custom where two equals would exchange gifts, but Cortes didn't give anything in return, insulting the Aztecs. Yet nonetheless, Montezuma offered the Spanish to live in his father's, Emperor Axayacatl's palace while they were in the city. Inside this palace, the Spanish found a large amount of treasure, which was Axayacatl's inheritance to Montezuma. While they couldn't bring it back with them yet, the Spanish did plan on stealing the inheritance as soon as possible. Things escalated even further when the Spanish asked to put a cross and a picture of the Virgin Mary, two important Christian symbols, alongside the Aztec gods on top of their Great Pyramid. And just in case the significance of this is lost on you, this would be like an Indian delegation asking to put a giant golden statue of Buddha in the center of Mecca or Vatican City. As you can imagine, the priests were furious and the request denied. Then some Aztecs killed several Spanish soldiers at Veracruz. And the Spanish response? Well, they held the emperor hostage to ensure their own safety. And this was just in the first week in Tenochtitlan. And while the Aztecs wanted to attack the Spanish and drive them from their soil, the emperor was afraid the Spanish would kill or replace him. So, for half a year, Montezuma was the puppet emperor of Cortes. And while they stayed in the capital, they were getting a pretty good idea of how brutal their hosts were. So, let's take a closer look at how the Aztecs were brutal by selecting three random gods. The Rain God, Fertility God, and Fire God. The Rain God required tears, so they would beat a child in front of their friends and family. And only when the child and their loved ones had cried enough, would the child be drowned. The tears would bring rain. Obviously. Or maybe a priest decided a woman looked like the fertility god. Then they would first get you drunk, force you to drunkenly dance your way to the nearest temple, and then remove your head. The blood that came out of the neck would bring fertility to the crops. Try not to think about this next time you go to a bar. Or perhaps the fire god needed another sacrifice. Then you'd first get drugged to anesthetize you, then they will tie you up, and if you think that still isn't hot enough, they would throw you onto a fire. When you are nice and crispy, but still alive, they will take you out of the fire to finally remove your heart. While the Spanish probably didn't witness all these types of sacrifices, it does beg the question, how could the Spanish see them as anything other than utter savages? How could these good Christians approve of such behavior? How could they not think they were superior to the Aztecs? But the Aztecs thought this was their holy duty. They believed that if they did not provide enough blood to their gods, then the world would come to an end. The sun would stop rising and the world would be covered in an endless long night. And it went deeper than that. The Aztecs simply couldn't understand the Spanish obsession with gold. They didn't understand the very reason they were there. And this makes sense. When you don't have a monetary system based on gold, then gold has no more value than the jewelry you can make out of it. The Aztecs didn't understand the Spanish because they were stupid. 
they didn't understand the Spanish because they had never even conceived of the idea that something with little inherent value could be used as currency. The Aztecs had a currency based on cocoa beans, which you can make chocolate out of. And chocolate has obvious value. I mean, look at this. Forget the gold standard, we need the chocolate standard. But remember when I told you that if a Spaniard wanted to conquer territory in the Americas, then they would first need a permit from their monarch? Well, Cortes never got that permit. And by now, Spain had sent an expedition to rein Cortes back in. So Cortes had to leave to solve this issue, taking his most disciplined soldiers with him while leaving the least reliable ones back in Tenochtitlan which resulted in the remaining Spanish soldiers deciding it was a good idea to massacre thousands of unarmed Aztec nobles. Not long after, people gathered around the palace where the Spanish had been living and put it to siege inside their own city. And for the only time in history, the Aztecs chose a new emperor while the old one was still alive. They chose Quilowak, the brother of Montezuma II. He was in strong opposition to letting Spaniards in their city, so he seemed to be a good replacement. The Spanish, who still held on to ex-Emperor Montezuma II, sent him to the balcony to persuade the people that they should let the Spanish go back to the shores in peace. But remember what the Aztecs thought were good emperors? They believed an emperor should be a strong warrior, a brave leader, and the embodiment of their sun god Huitzilopochtli. Instead, they were spoken to by a man who let himself be captured, let himself become a puppet, and now asked them to peacefully let the Spanish go. We don't know exactly what happened, but Motokazuma was killed that night, both sides accusing the other of regicide. But, regicide or no, the Spanish had to escape. With all that gold, of course. While sneaking out of the city, they were spotted and were forced to cut themselves through the Aztecs to make it out of the city. Most of them would drown in the canals as their armor and stolen gold dragged them down. But while they were alive, the new emperor wasn't as diplomatic as Montezuma had been. Quilowak had the retreating Spanish forces attacked until they arrived in Tlaxcala. And while they were seeking refuge in Tlaxcala, the Spanish began to prepare for an invasion of Tenochtitlan. They received reinforcements from Cuba after Cortes convinced everybody to join his side. And he received an estimated 100,000 soldiers from Tlaxcala and various Aztec tributary states. On top of that, Cortes managed to convince almost everybody else to remain neutral, meaning the Aztec couldn't rely on their tributaries for support. But while the Spanish had been preparing, they also began wondering. Wondering why the great armies of Tenochtitlan didn't lay siege to Tlaxcala and do away with the Spanish force once and for all. Well, a smallpox epidemic started ravaging the empire. An empire that had never even conceived of the concept of a plague was all of a sudden dealing with one of the worst diseases humanity had ever seen. The plague killed tens of thousands, including the emperor himself. The ravaged Aztec quickly elected a new emperor, a man named Kuautamak, the eldest son of Emperor Awitzotl. The two sides would fight various battles. Sometimes the Aztec would win, and often the Spanish would win. For the Spanish and their allies managed to get an army together that far outmatched that of the Aztecs. One by one, the Spanish army managed to conquer the surrounding cities of Tenochtitlan, with Cortes making the ancient city of Texcoco his base of operations. And it's at Texcoco where the greatest works of Aztec literature were being held. And it's at Texcoco that the Spanish would burn those libraries to the ground. Which is why we know so little about the Aztecs, and many of our sources come from after the conquest. The siege of Tenochtitlan lasted for nearly eight months. The first problem was that the city was only approachable through the causeways. That meant that only a few warriors could stand side by side and were vulnerable on their flanks by attack from canoes. After Spain lost the first battle on the causeway, they scuttled their ships, dragged the individual pieces all the way to the lake, then rebuilt the ships in the lake. 
and spears and arrows were no match for bolts, bullets and cannonballs. They also destroyed the aqueduct, depriving the people of sufficient fresh water. And they blocked all the causeways, depriving people of sufficient food. And only when everything was against the Aztecs did the Spanish manage to push the Aztecs back on their great causeway. The Aztecs fought on to the end. They fought in Texcoco and Tlacopan. They fought from the long causeway to the narrow canals. They defended their island city, whatever the cost. They fought on the streets, they fought at their temples, they fought at their homes. They never surrendered. They were defeated. Even after the Spanish and their allies entered the city, it would take another three weeks before the last of the Aztec forces were defeated. After which, they sacked the city for an additional four days. It is estimated that 100 to 240,000 people died, and thousands of survivors were brought back to Tlaxcala for sacrifice. But what happened to Mesoamerica after the conquest? What happened to the Aztec? After all, despite the hundreds of thousands of deaths, there were still tens of thousands of Aztec people left. Well, their city was to become the new capital of the new Spanish colony of New Spain which the Spanish renamed Mexico City, because the Aztecs referred to themselves as Mexica. The emperor was tortured and eventually executed. The Aztec people were nearly wiped out, as mostly children and the elderly survived the carnage. But parts of their civilization endure to this day in modern Mexican society, even though their empire was destroyed with their capital. With Tenochtitlan defeated, there wasn't really anyone left to pay tribute to. That was, until the Spanish visited these tributary states, demanding they pay tribute. Having just faced down plagues, there was no other alternative but to capitulate. They became part of the colony of New Spain. And over time this colony would conquer all surrounding civilizations. Mayan, Tarascan, and many more. On one hand, people weren't being sacrificed anymore. Cortes made that practice illegal. But the Spanish would slowly implement a system of centralization to make New Spain's government structure similar to Europe's. It would take away power from individual states and incorporate it into a single unified state, eroding many of the individual cultures inhabiting Mesoamerica at the time. For example, the Aztecs had universal education. The Spanish replaced this system with church teaching, limiting the amount of people with an education down to a handful. And that great pyramid in Tenochtitlan was taken down to build a cathedral. This temple wasn't rediscovered until the 20th century. And when silver was discovered, thousands were sent to their deaths in the silver mines. Their deaths would drive the economy of New Spain and would, eventually, cause the Spanish inflation that would end Spain as a superpower. The Spanish would send missionaries to convert local peoples, with varying degrees of success. The locals and the Spanish didn't understand each other's religions due to the same communication issues mentioned earlier. With the locals creating hybrid religions, incorporating parts of their own religion and Christianity. Christianity was as incomprehensible to the local population as the Aztec religion is incomprehensible to us today. At least, I hope nobody in my audience is sacrificing their neighbors to the sun. But it is not to say that all civilizations were worse off. Not at all. The Tlaxcala in particular were given a higher status and were often given more prestigious roles. They supported the Spanish in various wars and intermarried with the new Spanish colonists, creating an ethnically mixed nobility in New Spain. And Afro-Eurasia gained access to chocolate. For thousands of years people had to live without chocolate. But we also got tobacco and tomatoes, so it's not all good. After the Spanish conquered the Aztec Empire, the Spanish would soon forget their native allies when they would write the history books. The Spanish conquistadors would attribute their victories mostly to Spanish might, Spanish steel and God's will. They would in fact believe that their conquest of the natives, their brutal treatment and their forced conversion to Christianity were a great benefit to Native Americans. And this is somewhat understandable. When you have been taught your entire life that people who aren't Christian will be sent to eternal hellfire, if you are taught that Christian civilization is the greatest civilization to have ever existed, then it's understandable that you think you're spreading goodness. 
then you believe you're spreading the greatest way of life and saving their souls. And who could argue against that? And so for centuries, the narrative of the righteous Spaniards was propagated throughout the world. But the greatest lesson of all is that the Aztec Empire didn't fall because they were invaded. Nor was it disease. Plague killed the people, and the Spanish merely gave the rebellious subjects a leader to unite behind. No, it was the Aztec who killed the Empire. It was their failed political system that doomed them in the end. If they had centralized, if they had answered problems not with weapons, but with benevolent policy, if they had created a unifying culture, then the Spanish wouldn't have found any allies, and disease wouldn't have been their undoing. True. It is unlikely a colonial European country would live in peace with a technologically inferior country. And while it's likely that the Aztec Empire would have fallen anyway, Dead Dawn did not need to come so soon, so suddenly, or so savagely. If the Aztecs had put better leaders on the Empire's throne, a better culture in people's minds, and a better political system as their government. But this did not happen. Instead, the Aztec gave the most convincing argument against feudalism, brutality, and the rule through fear. Because one day, your vassal will rebel. One day, your people will revolt. One day, a government will no longer be feared. And when that happens, governments fall. From the earliest civilizations all the way to the 21st century, governments failed to learn this lesson, thinking that they will be different. But they are not. Look at any government which rules through these methods, and they will follow a similar collapse as the Aztecs. Did you like this series and want more of it? Then let me know in the comments whether you want me to cover a Mayan city-state, the history of Teotihuacan, or perhaps you'd like to learn more about other Mesoamerican states, such as the Tarascan state. Tell me down below about that, because otherwise I'll find other topics to cover if people don't really like these videos.